friends. Welcome to the Lee Worship Well podcast. I'm your host, Chris Baker. And today, let me tell you, we have heroes on this here podcast. I mean, people that I revere, I have a tremendous amount of, of respect for. They have been in the game for a minute. Um, they are trendsetters. They are setting a pattern. And I am very blessed to have a great relationship with all of them. So I just want to introduce our panelists today for uh, this Black History discussion. So we have Mr. E.J. Gaines. Mr. E.J. Gaines, he is the VP Marketing Director for none other than Motown Gospel. What up, bro? Hey, hey, Chris. Thank you for having me, man. It's good to be here. Man, glad that you're here. We have my little sister. I think this is everybody's little sister (laughs) who is doing an amazing work in the kingdom. I love her dearly. Doe Jones. Doe, you know Doe. She's an incredible songwriter, uh, singer. She's been nominated for all of the awards, but let me tell you, she's an incredible worship leader that has a great heart after God, and I absolutely love you, little sis. Thank you so much for making time for Thank hopping on. Thank you for on. having me. I'm glad to be here with the legends. <laughs> and the legend of all legends, none other than, let me tell you something. I hate to even say Godfather, because but you are, bro. I mean, you you are the pattern. Let me say that. That's your name. You're the pattern. Wow. The pattern. None other than Mister. I'm gonna say Pastor Aaron Lindsay. Aaron has won every award that's ever been invented and created, and he's deserving of all of them. Bro, thank you so much, and all of you guys for taking time out of your schedule to just have this conversation with us as we discuss our history. I don't like to say black history like it's, you know, segmented over because it's really, it's American history. Um, It's had a huge impact in what we do in our culture from so many different um, uh, dimensions. And so we want to talk today specifically as it pertains to the arts and music and black history music and black history and gospel music uh, specifically. So Let's just dive into this conversation. All of us have been impacted from in and by gospel music um, in some form or fashion. And I want to just kind of talk about, you know, maybe some of your influences. When did you fall in love with gospel music? Y'all remember that that show? I think it was not what what was it? Love and hip hop or it was something where when did you fall in love with hip hop? He asked the girl that question. Brown sugar. It might have been that. Anyway, I want to ask you, Aaron, let's start with you, big bro. When did you fall in love with gospel music? Well, being raised in a church that my father was the minister of music of, I had music around me all the time. So you, I think there is a moment I could point to, but I would just say being around it all the time, it was always a part of my life like mm. from baby up until now. Obviously it has been, but I remember I fell in love with it when I was about six years old and it, there was this awareness that the song invoked the emotion Whoa. and it hit me and I started crying and I hadn't been through the struggle and the things and all the stuff, but there was something powerful about it. And I literally as a kid can remember weeping and couldn't understand why. And it was in that moment that I, I think that was where I was marked and I would never like change. I was like, man, I'm here. You know, and yeah, I think like, it was, I think it was Hawkins. <laughs> I think it was um, Change, Tremaine. Whoa. That was, when they got to the van, it was something about that. I'm so glad <laughs> you <laughs> changed. <laughs> that five minor, yeah. back to the one, it just, it just yanked me and I couldn't get out of it. I, I, I can actually feel the tingles now. Like, you know what I mean? So <laughs> I think that was my moment. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. EJ, what about you, man? Oh, man. Um, I always say I came to faith through gospel music. I knew gospel music before I knew scripture. I knew gospel music before I knew Jesus, to be quite honest. And my dad and my mom played it around the house all the time. And it's the same thing that Aaron was talking about. It was It's those those moments where you realize the words of this and the delivery of it, really the delivery of it, the words for sure, but the delivery of it, the yeah. art and the craft of delivering those lines um, was just so impactful. I thought I can literally feel this through the recording. I could feel it. And I listened, my, my, my parents played all kinds of music, R&B, rock, pop. I, I did not feel it from that. I always, always, and this is apart from me knowing God, I always felt it with gospel music. And I remember growing up, my dad would always play the Winans 
um, on vinyl. Everything was vinyl. Everything was in the steer and, and the music yeah. just played at all times throughout the house. It was like, if he's cutting his hair, he's playing music. If he's cleaning, he's cutting his, his music. If he's cooking, it's music. And so we just always had music on, but the Winans, the Clark sisters, um, Shirley Caesar, um, just, I mean, it was just, it was a part of the air, the atmosphere yeah. of the house. And so I think that's when I, um, developed a love for it even before I realized what it meant. You know, um, and then once I realized what it meant, I could go back. And even now, I always talk about the fact that a lot of scriptures that I know, I know by the cadence of the song. So if I know wow. this, if I know a verse, I still think it in my head like the song when I learned it when I was six, you know, and I don't know how to articulate it apart from that rhythmic cadence, because that's how I learned the scripture before I knew it was a scripture. It, it was just verses to a song to me. Wow, that is so, that's so cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. Dope. Little sis, when did you, you know you didn't want me to you didn't want me to go in the middle so I could be sandwiched between the two great <laughs> I'm, pieces I'm of flipping bread. It around, I'm flipping it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be unpredictable. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think um, I think my probably what I have to say about this might be a little, little bit different because mom and dad played um, everything growing mm -hmm. up, um, and I think I fell in love with. I could pick it back off of EJ's. I am still falling in love with and fell in love with our approach to everything. Mm -hmm. um, and what we bring to the table as a gospel influenced person um, in a CCM setting, like if we're there, you know, we're there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can hear gospel influence in, uh, in every different genre. And I think that I grew up listening to like, um, the, the, the people who were kind of in the middle, but, um, like Ron Cannoli, you know yeah. what I mean? I actually was playing him this morning. Wow. And, um, and I grew up singing in choirs and singing choir songs and going to the convocation and not really understanding what it meant until, you know, I'm here now and I see us in everything and I see our influence in everything mm -hmm. and our approach, um, can be felt <laughs> in every genre. And I just think that's really special. And everyone wants it. You know, it's, it has been, it's always been on trend yeah. to bring a little bit of that into the pot because yeah. it just gives it that edge and which makes it not a trend. But um, so I just, I love that it's like this, um, it has this eternal se sense of like, it's always going to, it's always going to add something. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like that is so great. I always say this, um, you know, gospel music, man, was it was born out of out of pain. Um, if you go back to the spirituals and and the slave songs, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't because it was a wonderful day and everything was going well. It was out of out of pain and oppression and out of pain and oppression came this beautiful genre of music that has changed the game. And so sometimes when people are listening to gospel music, they're like, it's just, why are y'all so emotional? And I say, it's not emotion. It's called we're grateful. <laughs> it is, we are, we are a grateful people because we see what God has done. And, and through our songs, it has brought forth deliverance, uh, inspiration. And uh, I think it's a tremendous thing. I want to ask you this, Aaron, um, you talked about the Hawkins and, and um, that being an influence. What are some other gospel influences that, you would say, man, this really impacted who I am as a producer, as a songwriter, um, just as a person that's in the industry. Who would you say were some of your influences? Uh, well, my influences span so many different genres. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of like an amalgamation. But as I've gotten older, uh, I've had the opportunity to have met most of my heroes at this point mm -hmm. and to find out that those that are not known as gospel artists or musicians got their roots in gospel, helps me really realize that, um, I would say the commoditization of gospel music as a genre yeah, really um, started, there's a continuum of gospel music that predates Americanism um, because these songs that, this edge that Doe talks about or this, this energy that uh, EJ speaks of, like the feelings and the thing that I spoke of about the emotion predates Americanism. These songs and these these melodies were crafted in Africa and they mm -hmm. made their way because these songs were, were birthed out of slaves. And, and we can just, we know that those slaves heard it somewhere. Somebody's yeah. mama sang a melody and then they picked it up and then they put English on it, the, a learned language on these melodies. 
So when I think about my influences, they are like uh, obviously the Hawkins, Crouches, uh, Andre Crouch. Um, I also have been influenced by Ron Canoli and people like himself. I was I was surprisingly uh, I was influenced by Carmen. I think that big hybrid thing, you know, <laughs> helped helped me in Israel. I mean, obviously less the theatrics, but that big hybrid of like Carmen and Commission on stage together, you know, I would say one of my largest influences of modern day has been Hammond. Mm -hmm. I've always said if I could, if I can do to this generation what Fred Hammond did to me, then I've accomplished my musical goals. Wow. Uh, what Fred did in influencing boys to men and all these other groups that went on and influenced the world is kind of what I uh, dreamt of doing. David Foster, uh, he's a Foster. Canadian guy, but grew up playing church music, which is why he could write for Earth, Wind, and Fire. After yes. love is gone, and you feel the gospel in it, you know? <laughs> um, Quincy Jones, of course. So, um, but yeah, man, gospel is everywhere. We are everywhere. Blackness is everywhere, and it's beautiful. And I'm just honored to be a part of Black history. Oh, that's great. That's great. Dope influences. Oh, thank you so much <laughs> for putting me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, just, I mean, you talk about, I, I loved how we brought in Carmen and Commission because uh, Kirk Franklin bringing in someone like Crystal Lewis mm -hmm. also spoke to me. Mm -hmm. And um, Fred Hammond, of course, you know, I have moments, even as a woman, where I'm and, and mom puts the CD around and do all these acrobatics that you don't even understand until mm -hmm. she reaches the end. And then, then my mom looks at me and she says, she plays the keyboard too. Like she plays oh, piano. Wow. Yeah. So like, being exposed to f female black musicians who, who also could sing at the level that they, you know what I mean? Like, it was just like somebody who looked like me and, and I actually didn't struggle too much with that. I think the Lord put a veil over my eyes because I would look at like Israel and I never saw this, the, the gender as a limitation. I always knew like, I can do what he's doing. I can do that. Mary, Mary. I think when you listen to my voice, you can hear all of the mm -hmm. influences. And I, there's like no shame in that, that I took from all of those people and added it to my little toolbox. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a question I have for you, EJ. Uh, how do you feel that gospel music has evolved from an industry perspective? Oh, it depends on the day you ask me, um, whether it's going to be a hopeful or cynical answer. Um, but in the spirit of encouragement, um, you know, it's interesting. Gospel music has always, as Aaron said, it's always been, um, it's, 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 gospel music is black music, but it's also American music. It is part of American culture. It's one of the, the earliest forms of American music. Um, and actually I'm gonna quote Aaron Lindsay because he said something um, a couple of weeks ago at an event that we were at, and it was so profound to me. I wrote it down and I d didn't know when I would ever toss it around again, but I did text it to some people and I said, Aaron just said this, and so I've never been trying to steal the credit, but he said, gospel music is to the music industry what blacktop basketball is to the NBA. Mm. He said, it is where the best of the best have honed their chops to become who they are. And I thought, dog on it, <laughs> that is so right. <laughs> that is so, <laughs> it is so right, Aaron Lindsay. Uh, but it is true, it is, it is, it is that foundational thing and the trend of, or the, the um, where gospel music finds itself is in that, in that intersection at every mm -hmm. juncture. Um, you can see it from Thomas A. Dorsey, you know, starting what is now known as traditional gospel in the 1920s as a blues musician and, you know, playing blues chords um, in church and being completely blasted for it um, because he was bringing secular into the sacred. And now, you know, we would look back at that as saying way traditional, way old time, way not progressive. But it was so progressive that it got him kicked out of a lot of churches. Yeah. And then you see that same trend with the Hawkins family. And with the Crouch, uh, Crouch with the with Crouch, uh, Andre Crouch and, and, and Sandra Crouch, you see that with um, Kirk Franklin. You saw that with um, artists like the Walls Group. I mean, you see it generationally, where every time someone is pushing the limit yes. uh, on what these four walls can contain, the four walls of the church can contain, um, there's a group of people who don't understand it, 
and label it one thing. And then there's another group of people who say, I've never heard anything like that. I want more of it. Yeah. And that's the richness of gospel music, because every time that happens, um, it moves the genre into this new space. And so we're seeing it even now um, where this, um, I would call it a, a return to the um, progression of worship music, because I think Aaron and Israel and Fred Hammond were probably the pioneers in that space. But um, by introducing the idea of praise and worship into the black church, but now you see um, you know, Maverick City and House Fires and all of these movements that are making worship music accessible to broader groups and it's being called gospel and gospel is being put on stages that um, it's never been brought into before and it's being led forward by worship. Um, and so I don't know, it's just, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I feel like gospel music is any and everything. It is the backbone of music in America um, and it is eternal. And so wh why would it not um, have all these various iterations of it and uh, representations? Yeah, man, it's so greatly put. And I love how you walked us through from Dorsey, you know, even to with with Israel and then you got Mav City and, and all of that. But I want to talk to you, Aaron, real quick, because you were one of those trendsetters that we talk about the resistance. You had to experience it because you were actually you and is, you know, I mean, coming from Fred and what Fred was doing you know, grabbing the baton from him and then just taking it, I'm sure you were hit with some resistance. Kind of take us into like what that looked like, what that felt like when you were experiencing that, that resistance. Yeah, we had a conversation earlier where you were talking about being the pattern and, and I was mm -hmm. shaking my head. And part of my shaking my head was, yeah, in the moment, they were kicking our tails. They hated yeah. us. Um, mm -hmm. Why are you bringing acoustic guitar? Mm -hmm. Why do y'all bring these white sounding songs into the church. Uh, what is it about, you know, what is our music not good enough? Even though we had a lot of B3 organ and um, we always believed that the gospel was the message and that the container would shift from time to time, but the message is what it was all about. And we kept, yeah. we kept the message, but we also kept the grit. Like we, we tried to make it hybrid, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I love what EJ was talking about the evolution because uh, the world evolves yes. and it should. It should evolve. And when you're on the beginning, some people are pioneers and some people are pilgrims. That's just the fact. That's so good. Some people are going to be looking for new ways. And this generation deserves an opportunity to hear the gospel in a way that speaks to them. Um, but what I've known and what I can witness to and testify to is that as long as the gospel is the message, mm -hmm. our methods are many, but our principles are few, right? Our methods may change, but our but our but our but our principles never. Mm -hmm. change. So the way we bring it to the world has shifted. And again, the things that we called sacred before, uh, that are the style, are so old now. Like, but I remember when Andre, I was old enough to remember Andre Crouch being an outlier yeah. because he was playing on on TV shows and they called him the devil. Kirk, <laughs> Kirk Franklin is. I was going to say Kirk. He's the OG to a lot of people, but he's a contemporary to me. So I remember wow. I was there. I was there. I, you know, we want to revise history and make him the go to gospel. But I, I remember when they were talking crazy about Kirk. I was yeah. I, I was sitting next to him when he was hearing the things. You know what I mean? So to now see it, and, and there are many that see Kirk as OG. I was at the mm -hmm. math tour. And when he was singing songs, I would see the young people kind of check out like, oh. And I see my generation singing all the Kirk songs. And then when Matt would start singing, or Doe, or Jonathan McReynolds, we would, I love, I like lucky, not loved. I don't know all the words though, but those <laughs> kids knew all those words. And it was this beautiful cocktail of what is necessary for this generation. We always talk in scriptures about dispensations, mm -hmm. but that what that literally means is how God chooses to dispense himself to a generation. Mm -hmm. And I think there are dispensations of music. My kids deserve to hear the gospel. But they don't, they look at what we do as old. Oh, Mary, Mary are my friends. We're in the same age range. But that's, mm -hmm. that's my daughter's mom's range. Yeah. Doe is their hero. They listen to Doe sing when I pray. They're like, ah, oh, that's <laughs> utopia to me. Because she that's what I do. <laughs> we do. And I've been watching this young lady since the piano at the studio when we first did He Wants It All. She showed me the chords. You remember that? <laughs> I ended up playing it, but she showed me the chords. Uh, he wants it all. I was sitting there like, this girl has got it. Yes. Turns out, anyway, I, I'll, I'll digress. I'll get it back because I could talk all day. 
but it is important for us to embrace what's happening because it'll never lose the power if we keep the message connected to it. And I think that's more important than our style preference. Yeah, that is so great. So, do I want you to take me to that moment that uh, Aaron was just speaking of when, you know, you, you, you he's playing. <laughs> you know, all in the he same just environment. won't take let it go. That. Come on, let's he go. He just won't let it go. I showed him one chord <laughs> because... No, you don't show Aaron chords. You don't show Aaron chords. I was like, oh yeah, somebody, somebody taught me that chord. And no, he, they thought it was so it. adorable. Uh, I was so impressed. I was impressed. <laughs> oh, she's so. You good. know, when I talk about when I talk about that moment, actually, when uh, Tommy Sims produced our album and like brought in all these freaking crazy musicians. I say it, I paint the picture like this. I felt like I was at in a, um, this is gonna sound weird, I know, but just hear me out. I felt like I was in like a museum or a zoo where they bring in animals from other worlds or other planets <laughs> and you just are staring through a window and watching them do <laughs> what they do. You because love that, Aaron? Be, you love just that? because the level of, yeah, I know, right? We all black on here. We don't like being called animals. Whatever. I'm black. I could do it. But the You're level of musicianship, we hadn't been exposed. We hadn't been exposed to that level of musicianship before, uh, ever. So, like, I, you know, I remember sitting on this tiny little stool, hugging my knees, and realizing it was 5 a.m. in the morning because I was just watching these musicians, these animals, like, they're, animals on that whatever they do like i was watching these musicians uh do things that i'd never seen before and take our music mm -hmm. and just take it up 10 notches and i think and, and i just honestly like aaron being so nice to a little squirt like me you know who was just so insecure you, i didn't even know what to say like do i try to impress these guys or do i act like i got it which one, you know what I mean? Like, which one do I choose? <laughs> so kind and just welcoming. I remember we talked about fasting. You don't even remember this, Aaron. We talked about fasting that day and you encouraged me. You know what I mean? And um, so you accepting, because our sound wasn't super, you know what I mean? People didn't really understand what to do with that at first either. And it was like, well, what genre is it? And, um, and we didn't receive, you know, like, like, it wasn't like Kirk or, you know, mass rejection, but just like people coming alongside, like great names and legends coming alongside and, and like being so encouraging and kind. That meant so much to me. But I knew he was going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, um, you know, the reality is this generation has something to offer us. And I believe in co-mentoring. Yeah. I don't believe it's just one way. Yeah, just top I believe, down. I believe, yo, man, I may, I may show you some things but you can show me how to do those things faster and better. Mm -hmm. And you might, I always stay open. That's the only reason I'm, I believe I'm able to continue to be relevant to this generation is because I've got young people that are showing me things. Yeah. And in that moment, you know, again, though, you know, I, I'm not revising history. I'm saying, man, like watching you and your parents and watching your honor for your parents. I was like, oh, she's, she's gonna make it. I've seen yeah. that in, in the industry a lot where the child was honored their parents. That's the first blessing with promise, right? Mm -hmm. Honor your mother and father. So when I saw how you honored your parents and your commitment to the Lord, I was so impressed. I was like, she could tell me anything. And you did. You showed me more than one chord. I'm not going to let you sit there and lie to the good people. You showed me a lot. And you got in there and sang the heck out of it. And I wanted to Can, cry. Yeah, yeah. Listen, listen. Your Can I say this one thing? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. sorry. No. I just want to say this, though. My prayer today, because I'm watching this transition happen in our music industry, mm -hmm. my prayer right now is, Lord, I pray that when I get, that I'm in a different place and a new sound arises, that I'll know when it's time to mentor and to mother mm -hmm. and, and be able to, to step aside, even if I'm still doing it, but be able to move and make room and not be, you know, bitter or, mm -hmm. or over in a corner, still trying to prove something, you know, yeah. like that my identity will still be so set in him. But I think that that comes from having that from people yeah. like Aaron yeah. who are willing to like, you know, we're going to pour into you. What do you need? How can we help you? Um, it's just special. It's, you can't, you can't buy that. It, it, it is special. Respect, and I don't want to dominate Chris, but I just want to say this in context of what she said, there's this concept of passing the torch. Mm-hmm. 
that has this finality to it that makes older people kind of re- like feel like okay, I'm out, right? That's where I was going. Yeah. But so I'm sorry I, if, no, I, if I overstepped. I didn't mean. No, to you're good. Anymore. You're good. But there, but what I was taught by um, there's this uh, speaker named Joe Madison. He has a radio show, right? They call him the Black Eagle. He's a political analyst and all that kind of stuff. But I listened to him say one day. He said, "I'm not passing my torch. I'm lighting your torch." Mm, because good. we need we need the generational light as well. Yeah. And when you have this understanding that I don't have to give mine up, but I do have a responsibility to light yours. Mm-hmm. And then I need to stand next to you as long as I can to help your light shine brighter. And when yours goes out, I hit it again to make yeah. sure it stays lit. And then at some point, you got it. Yeah. And so there's that transition period that I think we forget that it's not just a passing that's not the responsibility only to pass it. Yes. You're responsible to steward that generation as well, make sure that their light stays lit. So anyways, I'm done. No, that that's beautifully put, bro. I, I've never heard it articulated that way. Um, but I can say I was on the receiving end of, of that, where um, so you, you guys were gracious, you, Israel, um, Jerry Harris. You know, I want to talk about unsung heroes, but like people that were so gracious in allowing me to come into that space you created a safe place for me to fail and you didn't kill me when i did and and it helped the exchange zone so it's all about honor we 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 talk about honor from the standpoint of honor going up but there's another set of honor that like it's it (laughs) you need to honor down too and even within the gospel industry, I think, because sometimes when you hear a former generation talk about the new generation, sometimes um, it is with disdain. It is with what is what is this? This is not even music. You know, we just had a, a recent thing that happened where that was concerned. And it really it breaks my heart because a part of me, like I understand what they're saying. But then I'm like, we, we don't we are missing it if we don't honor this exchange zone and really empower this next generation so that they can run. Because what you said, Aaron, they can run faster. They can do things at a quicker pace. Um, The way Jaden, my my son is 17, he's doing stuff at 17 that I'm 45 and I still can't even comprehend. Now, I can be the dad that says, uh, well, your way isn't my way and I'm going to put you in a box. Or I can realize there's a reason why God gave you fast legs right now. So I'm going to impart into you vision. I'm going to teach you about character. I'm going to teach you about integrity. I am going to steward that part of it. And I'm not going to make you feel like you got to compete with me in this exchange zone. EJ, you are in the industry. And I want to turn the conversation over to you and just ask you where this is concerned. Where have you kind of seen us maybe mishandle these moments? Yeah, you just nailed it with that stewardship thing. Um, God dealt with me some years back about opportunities and profile and um, experiences and how, you know, we're in a music industry, right. That really um, barters on the basis of profile and Mm -hmm. cachet, you know, what, what is your latest hit? What is your latest chart position? What is your latest award? Um, And those are tokens. And we trade those tokens for opportunities. We trade those tokens for relationships and um, the Lord was dealing with, with me one day. I was frustrated, if I'm, I can be transparent. I was frustrated at what I, what I identified as a lack of um, next generation executives in the music industry, in the gospel music industry. And I was really, I was, I was frustrated with God because I felt like I didn't have, uh, when I came up in the industry, I came up under what I consider to be giants in the industry. Um, Vicky Mack, Latayad, uh, Max Siegel, Monica Coates, Joseph Bernie, Damon Williams, Jojo Pata, Steph Andrew Wilkerson, um, oh my goodness, Brian Scott, who's still in it, you know, doing what he does, Tara Griggs McGee. Uh, I mean, just, I could go through the labels and Ken Pennell, Bill Hearn. I mean, you can go through the labels in these, just these giants who then poured into the next generation of executives. Um, who were just as eager and just as hungry to be a part of it. And I was looking at what I saw was a dearth of that hunger in the next generation. And I blamed it on social media, ease of access. You know, you can just become, you can just update your LinkedIn profile to say CEO of whatever entertainment group. But it's like, you don't know anything about 
the process of being of an industry professional. And so I said, God, this industry is going to die if you don't train up and raise up next generation executives. And he said, well, how are you stewarding what I gave you? Wow. And it was just the, just the, just the most gentle <laughs> 5 a.m. gut punch, you know, yeah. heart check that I had gotten. Cause it was like, I'm not, you know, I had gotten into this rut of, you know, amassing my network and my contacts and my relationships. And those were all my arsenal to do what I needed to do with anyone who's connected to me. If I'm managing you, you're, you're good. If I'm your attorney, you're good. If you're on my label, you're good. If I like you, you're good. But then the other people, I don't, I don't know what they're going to do. And that is not kingdom building. Kingdom building says pass on those relationships and steward those as gifts. Mm -hmm. Every relationship steward as a gift. And so when you talk about stewardship, Chris, or Aaron, as you're talking about passing that, um, passing the, the torch to light someone's mm -hmm. torch and yeah. still keeping your own, there's so much wisdom in that because I think, um, especially in the gospel music industry, because it's an, it became an industry around the music. It didn't. It's not an industry that was uh, that people sought out being in. Um, mm -hmm. People had to learn how to do it. You know, Kirk Franklin always says, "We didn't know what we were doing when we were on MTV. We didn't know how to be on MTV or you know, how to. We didn't. We weren't prepared for the stages. We weren't professionals who knew how to do the business of. We were just." some kids who got an opportunity and suddenly we were the ones and the rest of the industry has taken note from those people, but we are a ragtag industry that kind of by God's grace figured out how to do this well. And, um, and I think that there is value in passing those messages and those lessons on to one another, because um, the only way that we're going to survive is not just that the music and the creativity gets passed on, but that the industry know how and the, the excellence and the business acumen gets passed on as well, because God has given us to be excellent in that as well. Yeah. Um, and that's just a big, a big, big, big deal to me. Dude, that gut punch is, yeah, it's one of the, I got, I got punched in the gut like that too. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm glad he's going around. Dude. No, no, he's going around, bro, <laughs> because you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm in my, I'm in my mid forties. And so it's that whole thing of, I, I don't know when I got old, when it happened, it just happened. I woke up and I'm 45 and I'm like, and your back I don't was know and then it was, when. That was it. Right. But I, I realized this, there was a lot of things that our generation and Dell United, not generation, but our generation caught, um, you know, nobody ever taught me how to flow in service. I, I caught it in my mom's church and how she would flow in and out of songs. And she never taught me how she did it. It was, this is what it is. So I caught sensitivity. Um, what I realized is where this next generation is concerned and the generation that's even behind them, they're not catching it. I think it's our responsibility to teach it. How do we make a lot of what we have learned, like a lot of what you learned and caught EJ, just by being around those greats that you just mentioned, how do we translate it and make it palatable to this next generation? Yeah. Doe, Do, you are involved in something right now. We don't want, I don't want to disclose what it is, but it's absolutely incredible. Um, actually, you're doing it today. Um, I want you to lean into that ideology as it pertains to teaching the next generation translating things that you caught and teaching it to them you want me to speak on that right now yes yes yeah please. i'm i was actually hoping that you would ask me because i feel like i was on the tail end of um it being caught mm -hmm. and i think that there's such a high level of excellence in our churches now um, that we're afraid of, um, see, because when, when I was coming up, uh, I, they put me on, on the stage and it was okay for there to be a few awkward moments here and there mm -hmm. because I was learning. Yeah. And, um, and I think the church and kids and young people having the opportunity to really actually serve and kind of earn too, because we also throw people up really fast these days. <laughs> um, 
but that's not really a part of our culture anymore. And there's no room for someone to learn under pressure, right? Like Maya, my baby sister, um, we gave her a mic. It wasn't plugged in, but she was up there until she could sing a part. Mm. So, so she's in her 20s and she caught it and because she was in it and she was it. up there with mm-hmm. us. And I think that I come from, I, I couldn't say I come from a generation, but in, in my family and growing up, they threw us, they threw us in it, but they didn't throw us in it alone. They threw us in it with them. Mm-hmm. And it was, mm-hmm. there was this opportunity to watch and to be in it and there was room for mistakes. And I think, um, (laughs) I do think that today there isn't really a place for um, young people to to be in and and to catch. Like there, we haven't made room for catching really. Um, And I think it has a lot to do with um, how, and I hope I don't step on any toes, but how staged and programmed um, our services are, our church services are, um, and because it, that's the easiest way and the best place for someone with a heart of gold that, that has a heart after God to be plucked out of a crowd where they are hidden mm-hmm. and put, you know what I mean? In the background for yeah. us to say, catch this. And when you're ready, I'm going to throw the ball to you, you know, and you may fumble it a couple of times, but um, and obviously there are other ways for it to be taught, but mm-hmm. that's how I caught it Yeah, was in the moment, um, was being in the boat and fishing and watching my dad fish, yes. you know what I mean? For people, I hope I'm just using, um, you know, that's beautiful. What's the word? yeah. I, so, so I mean, for me, that's, that's where I think a lot has shifted in the church is, um, yeah. we're kind of afraid of the mistakes or, or awkward moments or, um, but it's like, Man, yeah, <laughs> I think that's how I got it. No, that's, that's how I got beautiful. it, and that's how I bring people. I bring young girls on the road with me that I mentor, and they don't know it, but I'm like, "Oh, you're singing, you're singing with me." And during the service, when the spirit is moving, I push them out there to hear from the Lord in the moment. Wow! And to yeah. sing and prophesy. Yeah, and they're fine. <laughs> we're just fine and they grow yeah. you know but we, we don't do that really yeah. anymore though church used to be the most gracious learning space in the world which is why mm-hmm. we all became right though like ej y'all chris we we became in in the space of grace and th- that has shifted it's become more like a catered space mm-hmm. and then we wonder why worship has diminished in our churches is because at some point from the platform, we've communicated that it's about you now, the, mm. the, the attendee, and it's not about him anymore. Because when we were worshiping Jesus, we were just pleased to see a young person worshiping Jesus, even if they didn't do it well. It was okay. Yeah. Now it's almost a liability to your programming if they don't kill it. Yeah. So you, it, it shifts That's the narrative. Good. And as a producer, I've learned, you know, again, I'm probably the oldest here, but I've learned my process of mentoring is is m a w l model assist watch and then lead mm, so like good. i did that with new breed right so i would model it i would stand next to buddy strong like hey this is what we do i'd have him watch me stand over my shoulder you know and at some point i would assist him so i'd let him play and i'd be like oh go to the d right now he wants mm-hmm. to go here all right yeah. no don't not church just yeah. work yeah, not church. Course, you know <laughs> Don't go, don't go diminished yet. You know what I mean? He's not there. That's not his vibe, you know? And then, then you watch. So you model for a while, then you assist him for a while, and then you watch and let him do it. Let him fail. Let him fall. Let him. I I I preached yesterday because I am a pastor now, which is crazy. So I'm challenged with this thing that Doe just said. I'm challenged with it in my spirit. I'm in LA. Performance is important. Yeah. And we've got the people in L.A. that are in our church are the ones that create the stuff that we all experience. So when I say creative, if I do a graphic, the guy that's seeing my logo is the guy that created Wakanda Forever's poster. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like he's sitting in my church. So there's a temptation to be really high level performative. And I'm, I'm, I'm faced with that now, though. And we have decided we have some people that we that are pros 
But then we have some that are aspiring and we give them a microphone and we let them stand and sing backgrounds. And it has been a challenge. Mm -hmm. But I know that the, the short term sacrifice is going to lead to long term blessings. Yeah. To not have six great singers, but have three amazing pros and then three people in development, you know, yeah. that are aspired, that are with them, that can that can watch it be modeled, they can assist, and at some point they can take it. So um, I appreciate that perspective, though. Thank you for sharing that. And I agree. I, to me, that's, that to me is the essence of succession planning. If we don't watch it, what we have caught will die with, a, with, a, with our generation because we don't create spaces for this next generation to come in and to catch it and to be taught. Um, EJ, your, your world is you corporate and industry. I want you to kind of speak from that lens. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's all one and the same really, you know, I mean, I think, so for example, we used to, uh, rely on certain TV shows or certain national events. You think about GMWA or, or Bobby Jones gospel or celebration of gospel, um, these kind of um, mainstays in our marketplace where um, once you had honed, um, honed in on what you were called to do in the local space, you might have an opportunity to be brought into the national space. And then the stage is the same vibe, you know, it's the same make or break, same learning area, but maybe higher stakes um, the stellar awards, you know, you get, you know, first you go to the pre-show and then you get on the main show and it's all these levels of, of, of making it. And, um, and I think as, as time has gone on and some of those shows have gone away, some of those opportunities have, have dwindled. Um, GMWA um, is no longer big GMWA week that the entire music community and every black Christian in America goes to. It's now the, the faithful, strong, day in day out gospel music professionals who go um and it's not the same uh, level of commerciality and and all the stuff that maybe we had at gmwa in the 90s and early 2000s it has meant less opportunities for the new artist stages or less opportunities for the quartet showcase or less opportunities for um you know just for you to get up and test it out you know that's where that's where songs were birthed you know you knew you had a hit if you went to a gmwa event and you sang your new single in front of the radio announcers and everyone was blown away it's like that's about to be the one and um i remember those moments i remember i remember sitting at a stellar awards event i don't know what the, you know this is when we everything was stacked on top of one another and israel was playing and i and and it, this may have been after um, another level had come out and he was just playing, but he was still in that space. And Aaron, you know it better, you know, Chris, y'all know, you know, that level of um, that pushback that, that Israel was getting from the black community, that he's not black enough. He's not gospel enough to do this. And he got on the piano and riffed. He riffed in a way that Kim Burrell would have had to been like, wait, you know, like it was that level of like, I can do this. I don't always do this, but I know how to do this. And it proved to everyone in that room, I remember everyone kind of feeling like, oh, so friend of God is what he did, but then he can also do that when he wants to. And it shifted the perception of him, you know what I'm saying? But those are the types of environments we don't have anymore in the industry. So when you have someone like Doe, I'm fortunate enough, I was in the founder's room at 101 Winter Circle at, at EMI Gospel when they did the showcase and fell in love with the whole family. and. Yeah. So when she came up from from he wants it all to now the solo stuff, it's like, oh yeah, that's dope. Like everyone knows that Doe's got it. But where does someone like Doe, if they don't have that pedigree, where do they get exposed now? How do we connect them to an artist when when you know artist exposure and artist discovery is 30 seconds on TikTok? Mm. And when gospel gospel fans aren't even on TikTok, well, how am I supposed to introduce a new gospel artist to a gospel fan? We don't have the same conferences. People don't watch the same shows that they're still happening. And we are not significantly enough in, entrenched in the social media space to actually um, impact TikTok and Instagram reels and YouTube shorts in that way. And so it really does create a disconnect for our gospel music community in terms of how we expose people to what's new. And church was always that, yeah. you know, at, after service, you knew who was going to, you know, the musicians are just going to play even when everyone else is gone. And if you wanted to be a musician, you were going to find your way to the drums. You were going to find your way to the organ and you were just going to sit there at the feet of 
whoever mm -hmm. was just playing in service. And that's how you learned how to do it. And so without those things, I don't know what that means for our marketplace. I don't know what it means for gospel music the genre. I do expect that it will survive. It'll yeah. just look, look and feel a little bit different. Yeah, it, it will most definitely survive. I, yeah. can, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Aaron been been the producer extraordinaire and the person that has been really at the helm of of transitions like this. What where do you see gospel music? Um, where do you see it going next? What's on the horizon? I think um, the fatal flaw of gospel music is when we make it dependent. The success of it dependent on the industry. Mm -hmm. That's the fatal That's flaw. That's good. Yeah. That's the kryptonite. The industry was created to highlight yeah. what was happening in the church. And now that I'm as a, now that I'm a pastor, I realize it's easy to complain like about we don't have this developmental space, but now I have this responsibility because I'm in the chair. Yeah, you have to give it. Yeah. What you gonna do with it? Right, don't right. Create, <laughs> create the black like, yeah. like don't complain about it. Like yeah. Because the truth is, like the progress of performance is hidden in the discipline of repetition. So you mm. don't get better, you don't get good enough for industry to highlight what you're doing until you have a place to continue to do it. Yeah. So you don't get better until you have a, re a place of repetition to get your reps. Mm. That's the church, and I think we need to redefine what success is to a singer. Now, we've I, we've defined success as I got a deal and I'm out on tour and I'm doing these things, or I'm on TikTok, mm -hmm. or I'm on social media. The real success is, hey man, I, I can really sing. It was a time where I can tell you Pat Henry, I could tell you names of people that you will never hear on a record they never recorded, but they could sing like mm -hmm. crazy. And they, they were content just doing that. We've, again, I started with the commoditization of gospel. That was the first thing I said, because we have turned the gospel in the commodity, which is, I get there's a, there's a need for it. And I'm yeah. in the industry. I need people to buy records. That's how I feed my children. So I'm not <laughs> mad at it. However, the origin of it, like jazz, it's happening to jazz, it's happening to R&B, it's happening to hip hop. There's no mixtapes no more. People aren't com content to do a mixtape. Like it used to be back in the day, there was a guy, a local dude in your hood mm -hmm. that was the best rapper and he was out there <laughs> selling tapes at the barbershop. Yeah, you man. You knew it was gonna be crazy. That's how DJ Khaled was born. Yeah. But that has gone away. It's, it's a cultural thing, not just a church thing. So now I have a responsibility. I think as industry is feeling this, it's time for the church to start doing this That's and start, start producing disciples and producing people that understand the heart of what it is. And as that comes back, I think it'll necessitate need for exposure. Yeah. And it, I mean, we might see new conventions coming back. We might see new events and they might be more digital but I just believe that God has a plan and it always starts with his church and with his people. Mm -hmm. um, what we sit on now, what I sit on is because of people like Sister Rosetta Tharp, who long before Chuck Berry and long before this, this lady was playing that guitar and singing and walking across stages and, mm -hmm. and just crushing it. You know, it's people like that that set the tone for what we do today. And now it's our responsibility to create new people like that. Put a guitar wow. in that girl's hand. And I'm a girl dad, so I, you know, I'm intentional about pushing women forward. Yeah. I always use Rachel, like Myron Butler did my Marvin Sapp stuff, but I started using Crystal, Crystal McConaughey mm -hmm. to do background directing. This girl knows yeah. parts. Yeah. She was teaching parts when there was a, a guy in charge. I'm like, wait a minute, yeah. something's <laughs> off here. You get up there and get this yeah. money. So Rachel, good, you man. get up here and do this money. Get this money. Yeah. I didn't wait for my son to get the bug for production. My daughter got the bug for it. So I'm like, That's come so on, Kennedy, get up in this studio. So I think uh, the responsibility starts there. And um, I could talk on and on about it because I'm passionate about it. But as a pastor, I got to do what I'm talking about and not just yeah. complain about it. Wow. Wow. That is, that is so great. Guys, this has been a tremendous conversation. I, I want to end here. Um, this podcast, they are worship leaders, they're worship pastors, they're musicians, music directors, songwriters um, that are serving in church. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, but I want to ask each of you this question. What would you tell 16, 17 year old Doe that she doesn't know right now? What would you tell her? 
Um, as it pertains to her career. As it pertains to whatever you want to tell her. I don't want to put it in a box. I think, okay, what I would tell her about where she was going to be um, is that she was going to run into it. Mm, um, that good. she wasn't going to have to struggle for it. That's good. <laughs> but she was going to run into it and um, not to wrestle with whether or not um, she was good enough for it or if God was pleased enough to give that to her, but just to love God and she was going to run right, right into to what, what, you know, where she was supposed to be. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. EJ. Am I saying words to, for 16 to 17 year old Doe or 16 to 17 year old me? I, would I have words from both too. of them. <laughs> you, I'll let you choose. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to take it broader and say, uh, you know, just a young, a young aspiring person in the industry. Yeah. You know. Whoever, whoever yeah. it is, it's, um, it really, it's kind of similar to what Joe was saying, you know, love God with all your heart and he will then give you the desires of your heart and yeah. you are going to, you are going to be exactly all that he showed you and more. Yeah. And, um, and what you need to focus on in that preparation period are the intangibles of integrity, uh, loyalty, character, mm. um, but then also become excellent, excellent, not excellent by the church's standards, excellent by your community standards. I mean, excellent at a world-class level, be excellent at that level. Um, because when you are, you're gonna get eyes on you um, and you're gonna wanna be able to point back to the creator and say, this is him that did this. Mm -hmm. And it can't be subpar. It's got to be excellent at at the at the highest level. I think that would probably be it. That's great, man. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And last but not least, Pastor. Man, I would tell sixteen year old Aaron, stop being afraid of things that are not going to happen. They're not going to happen. You, it's, un, it's unrealistic fear. Um. And I would tell a 16 year old aspiring artist, make your victories and your wins closer. Define success in closer terms. Yeah, you want a Grammy, but let's just let's just get better. Let's get our let's get better first. And then let's try to write a good song. Let's be cause because you'll continue to go as you experience wins. But if your wins are so far away from you, you'll always be here and never there. So let's bring there closer so that you can start to get the momentum of a victory and know what it is and it'll fuel you when you're in the season of no longer and not yet. Because that's more real than the win. You'll be in that middle space. But if you bring your wins closer and redefine success in terms that you can only come to by prayer, you'll start to see those victories and it'll give you momentum. And then you'll look up and say, wow, I've actually done some things. So I would put my wins closer. I wouldn't be afraid. And I would trust God the whole way. Wow. wow. Beautifully put from all of you guys. Guys, thank you all so much for taking time out of your schedule. You know, you could have been doing anything because you got so much going on. Uh, but you took time out of your schedule to speak to um, our listeners and share things that it took you years to learn, took you hardship to learn. Um, and we're learning from that experience. And so I want to say thank you all for that time. And so guys, listen, support everything that these guys are doing in the industry. They are game changers. I want to tell you, man, I love each of you, man. Mad respect for all of you. And God bless to all of you, man. So believe LA. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. Pastor Aaron and Adrian are the pastors of Believe LA. Come on now. <laughs> praying for you guys man love you guys and y'all take care okay